So welcome everyone to our podcast, Real AI Now. Today I'm very excited. We have a very special guest, Alex Alex Vasilev. He's the CEO of WeTransfer. Alex used to work at uh, Google, YouTube, then uh, at Join in Germany, a streaming company in a content company in Germany. And now since uh, I think around a year, year and a half, you are at it, we transfer. Welcome, Alex. Thank you very for joining. Very good to be us. here. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me, Paolo. Very excited to be on the podcast. And yes, I've uh, I've been at we transfer for actually now two years and change. Two years. Um, okay. But I recently took the helm as a CEO. Uh, prior to that, I was the chief uh, product and technology officer uh, for about uh, a year and, and eight months or so uh, before taking the mantle. But yeah, very excited to be on the podcast. Very excited to talk data and AI. Uh, and obviously it's an honor to get to cool. do that with you. <laughs> cool. Thanks again for joining us. So um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? I mean, um, your background, um, where did you start with, uh, uh, where did you start your career? How, how did you start all this? And, and at some point you ended up at Google. Mm -hmm. How did you, how, how did that happen? Uh, I guess guided luck. It's it's, it's what I used to used to say all the time. Um, well, I was born and raised in Bulgaria. Um, mm -hmm. About the age of eighteen, I packed bags and and in the pursuit of kind of technology, uh, moved to the U.S. Uh, for studying, and obviously ended up staying there for quite a while. But ultimately, I was always interested in technology. Um, ever since I was a very young child, that was one of the few things that was keeping my attention for longer periods of time. Okay. And it was very natural for me to go and kind of explore that uh, as, a, as an interest and eventually as a career. Uh, but yeah, I moved to the US. Uh, I spent some time obviously uh, studying there. And as I graduated, I had the, the chance to move to New York uh, and start working for Google. It was my, my official first job. Prior to that, I was an entrepreneur. I had a couple of uh, spectacularly failed ventures. Uh, <laughs> but I, I dipped my feet into the entrepreneurship uh, at a very early age. Okay. But ended up uh, at Google, where I spent close to 10 years, give or take, um, in various roles, started on the engineering side, moved into product, I did some uh, uh, technical program management in between. And ultimately, kind of my the, you know, interests were always skewing towards product building, um, especially in the creative space, if you will. I loved mm -hmm. the, kind of the, the drive of allowing folks to bring their creative talents to uh, to the masses. So I ended up uh, spending some time building advertising products, but then uh, quickly afterwards, I moved to YouTube, as I said. And I wrapped up my career at Google with some work on Google search mm -hmm. uh, before moving to Germany from the US uh, to take the helms of join, uh, building right. it pretty much from the ground up. Um, and we can talk more about what join is for those of your listeners who don't know. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, uh, my journey was always around technology, around product building, a uh, strong passion of kind of pushing the limits of technology and trying to see mm -hmm. how we can make people's lives better. Okay. Interesting. There's a lot there. Uh, so I, I'll i pick up first, uh, uh, ask you a question about uh, Google. So you talked mm -hmm. about um, advertising. Right. So, and the topic of this, podcast is of data AI, right? Real applications of AI. It's no secret that advertising is the main source of revenue of Google. Uh, so um, could, you, could you talk a bit about that for the, for the, the audience that doesn't know how Google makes money? Um, how does Google make money with data? Yeah. Right? Like, uh, like for, uh, on a nutshell, for, for dummies. No, I mean, it's very typical. I was at the Google back in what now people will refer to the a bit more early days, obviously not the very, very early days. I joined the company yeah. when I think it was about 7,000 employees. Um, and I left about when Google was over 100,000 employees. So okay. as you see, the company grew quite a bit in part of my tenure there. Um, no, but the idea of Google was always about solving problems for folks. Uh, yeah. Monetization pretty much came always... Second, it was, you know, we famously mm -hmm. had the, the motto of uh, do good by the user and the rest will follow. And the rest did follow. Um, but to your point about data, I think that one of the kind of critical element, elements that allowed us to, to do 
great products that are used by billions of people back at the time was that we were very focused on solving problems, but to understand some of these problems, you did have to look at data. Now, of course, some of the brilliant products like the search engine or, or yeah. uh, you know, uh, Gmail, they came up from great ideas, but ultimately they represented problems. And as you start building products uh, at Google, it was very easy to start, you know, solve some of the, those horizontal problems from many, many, many people, but understanding kind of where to take this product onwards was based on a lot of obviously looking at data and understanding trends and understanding where the, the next problem lies. But ultimately what that allowed is for, for Google to build products that had mass adoption across the planet. Right. Um, and that became a very interesting opportunity then for the company and for advertisers to reach these folks in a very contextually relevant way. So if you think about uh, the early days of search, you search for something um, and the ability to service an ad for that one thing you're searching so you can actually execute your desire, whether that's to purchase or to buy or to read or whatever, mm -hmm. was quite fundamental. And now right. I'm sure that all of your listeners <laughs> expect that to be part of what we all do, but back then was quite revolutionary. Um, the internet was still a very difficult place to parse and understand and find things. But right. uh, luckily, uh, once you got enough traction of your products, you can think about how do you make the, the lives of your, you know, of your users better and that mm -hmm. included monetization opportunities to connect them with the right product, mm -hmm. the right services as they need them. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I probably phrased it wrongly. Uh, I just talked about the angle of making money. Yeah. But in the end, Google makes money because it creates useful things uh, mm -hmm. for people that people use and want to use. And one of them is Google search. It's obvious, the, the first obvious thing. Uh, people use Google uh, because it worked, it was useful, right? And mm -hmm. that's how it started. Because mm -hmm. if they hadn't created a great search engine, uh, the rest would never have been possible. Then, if you if people are searching for something and uh, you kind of hook people up with a, with a, with what they're looking for, something that they can buy, all of a sudden you're creating value for businesses, mm -hmm. for individuals. And for Google, you create a win-win-win situation where mm -hmm. all of them benefit. And that, of course, is value. And value also it can also mean money, I understand. Yeah. Uh, so now, could you just give us an example of... So people use Google search. Uh, again, this is for uh, probably very basic for you. But people use Google search and they search for things. Mm -hmm. How is that information... How is that data used about what people search for, and how people behave, actually to place the right ad when they, um, for example, on Google search, I'm not even talking about the other types of mm -hmm. ads, but the search ads, mm -hmm. how is what data is collected and how is that data used to actually mm -hmm. place the ads that are more relevant for people? So the very basic way of working and i'm sure i'm not telling you anything that you don't know but perhaps it's interesting for some of the listeners is that you know it starts with you have to map the internet first i mean to make a search engine quite useful you have to understand um what's out there and you have to understand uh, what do people mean when they type uh, so if you have such a large audience then it starts there for example when you type woodcutting but you misspell it um how does google know what you really mean so it uses a, uh, an incredible amount of information that has built over the years with data to understand mm -hmm. what do people who usually misspell woodcutting, how do they misspell it? And yeah. it's not necessarily personal information, but it's trends of, of usage, right. right? So for example, um, the same thing is, you know, Google might look like, uh, look at all, you know, when you type woodcutting, what, what are the results that people search for? Uh, when they look at all the results, what do they click for? So you become kind of building this, what we call user journeys as to where do people mm -hmm. want to go next? Right. And I'll speak a little bit more to an observation that I kind of built by, by spending a lot of time at, at Google was a bit, a bit later, but ultimately what happens is that you start presenting a valuable information and usually folks are on a journey, right? Now you mm -hmm. can type what's the weather in San Francisco or what's the weather in, 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 in Lisbon and uh, you'll get an answer or what time it is, you, you get an answer. But ultimately, it almost always is some type of journey. So you, you can see kind of how folks are learning. So you might type woodcutting as the first thing. Then you might type woodcutting for beginners. And then you say the best type of wood. And then you kind of, you can see how people build their journeys of mm -hmm. knowledge on, on something like Google. Um, okay. 
And that presents a great opportunity uh, mm -hmm. to see, okay, well, at what point of ad is relevant? So you see ads even on the first, which is wood cutting, because Google will use a, a, a lot of signals to say, mm -hmm. well, people usually who look for wood cutting may be looking for tools. Right. But as you go down your journey, as you refine what you really want to learn next, it becomes much easier to surface some contextual advertising, for example, that uh, it's really relevant to, to what you need. So okay. you might be trying to build your shed in the back with some, you know, you want to get some, your hands dirty um, and build something. And then ultimately, as you, as you go down the line, Google will be able to contextually give you better uh, ad advertising that's more relevant to what perhaps you need. Okay. Um, so ultimately, again, it goes but back to the But also the results benefits. themselves, they're not ads, right? Like the... the just the Google search results, they also learn from what people do. Yeah, I mean, you, you, do, you do have ranking algorithms that will rank the quality of the page. It takes many, many, many signals as to, is that a good page to surface for somebody you know, uh, searching for that particular topic? Right. Now, what's really interesting is that you can take it further, right? And you see that perhaps if you Google today is that, well, if you're looking for transferring a big file and a business like, for example, we transfer, yeah. it, it's in the business of, of, of transferring, you know, big files, then what you can do is you can kind of as an advertiser target this, this audience that looks for these particular words, uh, because you, you know, those words represent something that you as a company do as a utility. Mm -hmm. So it, there is a, you know, Google presenting ads, but there's also the opportunity for advertisers to target a particular right. audience or particular keywords as you've searched, as, as yeah. you've seen. But ultimately where the goal is, is optimizing your online presence to signify much easier for things like Google engines or Bing or, or that, that go or whatever engine there is, what your mm -hmm. property online represents. So yeah. it's quite an interesting back and forth feeding to your point, intent versus utility, intent utility, and learning right. from that as you go along. Yeah. So um, maybe this gets a bit more technical. Uh, so uh, you talked about ranking, so ranking algorithms. So basically your results are ranking, ranked in terms of relevance and that relevance is uh, of whatever. So you type a search and the search results might vary from person to person, from location to location, depending on their relevance. And this is this kind of ranking, um, there's an algorithm it's probably Google's algorithm is much more complex, but it's there is a topic called learn, um, learning to rank, mm -hmm. which is, which means that the search engine learns over time with um, not only what people search, but also where they click. Uh, all these uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of parameters are used to compute the relevance of a certain thing. So would, yeah. would this be a like a, a more or less accurate description of it? I think it has evolved. I mean, listen, I, I was there yeah. in, you know, six, seven years ago. I mean, if you talked about AI at that time, it was very different, right? So I don't know yeah. where the, the search engine is, but the original Google search engine was built yeah. without necessarily an AI component. It was just a lot of good ranking. So it would yeah. look at the page and determine if that page is well structured, if the information is useful. And that's why even to, to this day, people talk about SEO optimization, right? They, they build yeah. their marketing techniques to make sure their website really can tell that engine who is crawling what exactly that website does. What is so back then about, was, yeah. yeah, back then, I, I mean, my time at Google, you wouldn't necessarily see different results if you're a different person in different parts of the planet, you'll see the same results because if you, you know, type wood cutting, Google should be able to give you the best wood cutting um, information that you want. Um, regardless if you sit in, you know, um, mm. New York or, or, or Lisbon on Karachi, okay. right? I mean, it, it shouldn't matter. What becomes really interesting is, you know, when it becomes a bit more personal is, you know, people, people in many ways, especially nowadays, I presume, use Google for information seeking, right? So, yeah. uh, which means that information seeking, not only in general, like a woodcutting, but very specific. So when you type a restaurant name, and you say restaurant name, you know, opening hours. Now, there might be a thousand cities with a thousand restaurants with the same name across the globe. So how does Google know to give right. you the one that's near you? So that's when things like personal signals mm -hmm. around what's your location, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what's your, and this is kind of how you go into this discussion mm -hmm. as to how do you make things relevant by revealing something about you mm -hmm. uh, to these companies in order for you not to spend three hours searching for the restaurant in that particular right. city and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
and to resolve like uh, disambiguate things yeah. for example uh, I, yeah. I have an example for, from a few weeks ago I uh, in San Francisco we were looking for a restaurant called the restaurant was called North Beach you know, advertising mm -hmm. free advertising for North Beach well North Beach is actually a uh, like a neighborhood or uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. San Francisco so you type restaurant North Beach it gives you all the restaurants of uh, in that mm -hmm. region or that particular restaurant mm -hmm. <laughs> which was actually north not in north beach was somewhere else mm -hmm. so even uh, even google gets confused sometimes <laughs> it's difficult i mean again yeah. if you start thinking about the complexity of you know using taking a two to three word input and yeah. parsing all the information in the world that's online and deciding what is relevant it's actually quite yeah, a complicated it's hard task. it's quite hard <laughs> it's quite a complicated task yeah. Um, so, because I mean, I I spent some time working on 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 particular. You were also kind of... a product manager at Google Search, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when I was there, we had this interesting thing we wanted to think about, which is, well, how do people learn at, on on Google, and how do we make the engine more useful for folks who learn? So mm -hmm. if you think about the problem of, you know, I used to use that example all the time internally. It's like, well, if you type climate change or as a topic, mm -hmm. listen, there's climate change for kids, climate change news, climate change scientific papers, climate change uh, uh, right. trends, uh, uh, companies. So show? it becomes a quite interesting of how do you take, how do you take these kind of broad topics and help people um, navigate them and get to, to the specific things that they want. So if you think about these journeys, as we call them, they start as something super broad, then mm -hmm. people will learn, read, learn, come back, refine their search to something a bit more specific than read, learn, come back and refine something to much more specific. And it gets in every iteration, you see kind of the learning of the topic mm -hmm. that the people will do. So the question became back then for my team was, what well, can we help with that? So what is the most natural? So you, you, you mean like, you, you mean like the, the, the search results will be actually influenced by your previous searches that you did and kind of give you yeah, try not, to give you irrelevant results well, depending on what you search in the past also no it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that so we we tend we tended to think a little bit about the the, the question of well if somebody's typing global warming and then the next thing they type is global warming news what is the most probable next search that they might be doing to refine Okay. And the idea became like, well, if we can take a complicated topic and help people navigate to the thing they're really interested in by segmenting, whether that's like um, surfacing, you know, these knowledge cards that are very specific on a specific topic or presenting additional information for you to quickly go down the mm -hmm. rabbit hole, if you will, of learning. Um, that was quite an interesting problem because in the end of the day, you know, we all wanted to think we are very, very unique in many ways we are um, as people. But we tend to follow similar paths um, mm -hmm. that if you have enough people follow a similar path, you can technically look at what the first couple of searches of somebody going down the, the learning curve. And you can kind of anticipate what information might be useful down, down the line for them. And then you can preemptively surface them even before they search. You can preemptively surface them. Wow. Now, I'll give you another example. If you search of net worth of Joe Biden as a president, and then you search net worth of Donald Trump, well, maybe you're going down the path of figuring out the net worth of each president. So very naturally, we should show you the net immediately an easy Obama. way. <laughs> yeah, the easy way for you to, to click on something that will show you the net worth of Barack Obama or, or George Bush or yeah. Bill Clinton or et cetera. So that's where the data becomes quite interesting because you're able to build in many ways paths through, through the vast information that exists mm -hmm. out there. That okay. allows you to to surface it a bit more easy and, and a bit more 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 quickly uh, mm -hmm. to to users. So, and is this actual AI or is this uh, so does this use machine learning? Is no, when sounds... we were thinking it uh, eight years ago, it was an AI. Okay. <laughs> so I don't I don't know if that has evolved. Uh, it, it probably could do that now. But mm -hmm. if you can imagine, like more generically, outside of if you just talk about Google, I mean that vast amount of information by so many people who are doing it, you could, you know, use the machine learning models to anticipate that. Uh, we'll do that now, I believe. Yeah, well, yeah. Especially with these um, short-term memory models, with transformer exactly. models, you could do that nowadays, I think. 
Okay. Very, very. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Google is doing it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't <laughs> know now, but I mean, it was as you can imagine, like it, 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 machine learning is now everywhere around us, whether we see it or not. Yeah. And I think the utility of that parsing of data, which is kind of how I think about machine learning superpower, is parsing large amounts of data and finding patterns. Um, it's quite useful in many, many different ways. Whether it's you know something like Google or mm -hmm. something like Facebook or something like Twitter or or what whatever um mm -hmm. but the idea is that we're not that unique in, in our behavior and patterns <laughs> so it's it's in many ways you could make not as we think not easier. as much as we think we are <laughs> Sad, sadly no even though we, again we are unique in many different ways but um in, in terms of some of the basic knowledge paths that we follow uh we, we okay. follow the same logical path interesting so what about um content so if you don't mind uh, i i think that's something that you worked uh, with for some time at youtube and then at join can we talk a bit about that um the the data driven and the the, the, the data driven aspect of consuming content in this particular case video for example at youtube so what you just described for google search and the way he, people find and consume information um how does that transfer to video content it's very similar right it's, it's just a different type of information you're consuming so again i don't know what youtube does per se today but um i always thought it's an interesting experiment if you if you have an account with youtube um and you watch a lot of videos uh and at some yeah. point your recommendations probably will get into the realm of what you find interesting and it might have some new things it might have things you've watched many times because the you know algorithm knows that mm -hmm. you find that an interesting what a good test is for for you or your listeners is don't create an account go on a fresh you know browser or a page and start watching videos as you normally would and i guarantee you at some time the algorithm will know and will service pretty much the same things they're servicing on your login account. And that's not because they're not, you know, they don't know who you are or you don't have an account per se associated with this data, but mm -hmm. the data is such that people follow paths. So eventually if you do it, if you, if you take enough steps in a certain path or to kind of show your interest, YouTube or any other platform really will start to understand what's okay. the next thing that you probably want to watch. Okay, so that, that is kind of the, the topic of recommendation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so talking about recommendation, I, I, uh, I don't know a lot about the topic, but I remember uh, when I uh, dig a bit into the topic a few years back, uh, there was things like uh, collaborative filtering, um, things like, um, okay, people who watch this also watch that kind of uh, kind of thing so um a bit like uh, at amazon when you're buying something or you're looking at the product amazon suggests the people who bought this also bought that or people who like this also like that kind of thing uh, is that is that something that is done with content uh, um it's a good question uh so when i was at join we were thinking a lot about how do you build the next iteration of a recommendation engine? Uh, could the you problem, talk a bit about Join? Could you tell? Yeah, Join, the join is, is, a, is a video streaming service in Germany. Um, it, it was a joint venture between, uh, it was founded as a joint venture between ProZip and Satines and Discovery International, two broadcasters, one local, one international. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to create a new European based content service uh, and our vision was to create it based on what we called local content because mm -hmm. Europe is one of those markets where local content is incredibly strong and there was really no aggregator at that point for content that speaks to you locally what I mean by that is you know if you live in Munich something filmed in Munich or something filmed in Berlin something that feels a lot more authentic mm -hmm. because of course yeah. the American services are quite amazing at that uh, at, at global content global mega me mega hits and, and whatnot but People in Europe still want to watch things in their language. They want to watch uh, things that are closer to them and they can identify right. themselves. And that's why, you know, you have something like The Office. Uh, it was one type of show in Britain. It was very much adapted to being different in, in, in um, the US. In different Germany, show, it was yeah. called Stromberg. 
Stromberg, um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, Stromberg. And, and the idea <laughs> that why they just didn't take the British one and showed it everywhere was that, of course, it, people are different, you know, cultures are different. So you wanted to kind of highlight the cultures that people can associate with. So we ended up building quite a successful uh, product, uh, quite a great brand. And we did uh, build a very strong portfolio of aggregating content that existed from partners, but mm -hmm. also filling the gaps that we saw in opportunities to build our own content as well. Um, mm -hmm. So ultimately, it's a video streaming similar to Netflix that has strong um, focus also on live TV, uh, which uh, at that time when we started was, you know, everybody said that live TV is dead and now everybody's going back to live TV with ads, which is very interesting kind of dynamic in the market. Um, but the service itself, given that we, we built a sustainable, uh, quite substantial user base and sustainable kind of content pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, we did have to tackle the thought of, well, how do we recommend content? Yeah. Um, the interesting part back then, and I'm sure somebody now has probably figured a very smart system, the challenge then was content watching, especially that it's long form, meaning at YouTube, you can go down a rabbit hole uh, and spend some time. But if you sit down in front of a, I don't know, smart TV or even on your laptop or your phone and want to watch long form content. Um, recommendations are quite interesting challenge for a couple mm -hmm. of reasons, because not to generalize, of course, but maybe if it's a rainy day and it's gloom and you might want to watch a very different type of content than you want to watch on a sunny day or, or, or in a context of your mood or your emotions, if you feel happy if you feel sad and okay and and that's incredibly difficult to predict yeah. so it's not necessarily the type of content but also the context of the content uh, okay. that people carry with them was very difficult so that's why not there's not a like a yeah. universal amazing and there was, there was these, the um, i remember when i was reading about the topic and trying to educate myself on the topic of recommendation i read some articles about what netflix did did a, little, a lot of noise about their um, recommendation uh, system. And uh, well, after a couple of years, they switched it off, and started from scratch because it didn't work. <laughs> and it didn't, at least they didn't deliver the results. People didn't like the recommendations and didn't use them and it, it didn't really add value. So they, I don't know what they're doing today. They are definitely recommending content. I don't know based on what, but they kind of dropped the, the whole original idea they had maybe because of what you what you said because it's just so difficult to predict what people like and what people well, are in the mood to watch yeah i think it's easy to predict what people like it's very difficult to predict the emotional state and the mood in that particular moment mm -hmm. um and i mean again my knowledge is somewhat stale given that i've been out of the mm -hmm. the, the streaming business for for several years now but mm -hmm. um Kind of the, the, the proven path to recommendation was still the good old, you know, actors, genre, um, settings, um, plot lines, uh, okay. direction. That is much, you had to do a lot less with machine learning or, or algorithmic. It's much more about very simple curation. Um, and you just watch the, you know, famous, you know, action movie with someone or a comedy or romantic comedy. And then the next, probably will be something along the same genre or mm -hmm. you have the options to go down on a similar kind of content with the same actor. Okay. Um, and I don't think it's gotten a lot more sophisticated, at least from my experience watching mm -hmm. um, things. But what we did back then at Join, we also added the human element. And I think that's where some of the power of this, um, especially on a local level, some of the power of, of kind of marrying data and recommendation engines plus human mm -hmm. curation, it's really shown the strength because, you know, if you have, if you're, if, if you work in Germany or in the South of Germany and, and yeah. you end up having a curation team there and the mood is something or there's news or whatever, you can, you can kind of overlay the engine recommendation with some kind of contextual recommendation that comes from a human and that becomes a bit more powerful. Um, okay. But people feel have different emotions at different times. So that becomes still, still a problem uh, to predict. Okay. I interesting stuff. Um, I, I read at some point, well, and you hear about these things, I'm not sure if they are true, um, that for example, well, Netflix or whatever, I mean, I would be interested to know if you know anything about this YouTube or Netflix that they actually 
look at the data around a particular video or let's say an episode of uh, uh, of the office and that uh for example netflix knows um how people behave when they're watching their episodes so if that episode for example people tend to stop watching it at, at a certain point if they watch it uh from beginning to end non-stop or if they tend to leave at a certain point or uh, or in the context of a particular series let's say people start watching the series and series one works very well and then becomes the second one and this the the second season right comes and they kind of stop watching it at the third episode so is this data used in any way to kind of measure the success or to kind of um i don't know uh, to kind of influence um anything I mean, I'm speculating, so I haven't seen it in action, but, uh, you know, I'm speculating that it is and it isn't in many ways. So it is to understand um, whether you've built something or you've created something that actually carries interest, but it's less to say, oh, wow, people watch this particular scene, we should have more of this scene or this type of humor. That becomes very subjective and it's very difficult yeah. to measure. Okay. Um, plus signals are not what I call clean, right? So you might have stopped it for some other reason than just you don't know, you don't want right. the content. However, there is elements that, you know, these platforms have, have done very well in terms of to, to minimize some of the risk of content not connecting with the audience. For example, YouTube will still, even to this day, it will tell you don't post an hour me, you know, video on YouTube. That's not the watching behavior. If you want the people to finish your video, you should probably make it a bit short. I don't know what the, the time is now. Back in the day was, 15 minutes was the, mm -hmm. the average attention span. So I don't know what it now. It could be an hour. I don't know. Uh, but the similar for, for Netflix, maybe, you know, evening might have a different type of completion rates of certain type of um, uh, shows. Right. It might also, you know, the amount of time you search, uh, it can also have a ramification of, do you want to watch a super long content like a movie or you want to watch an episode of a series? But back at the time when I was involved into the business, uh, we hadn't cracked it yet. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of startups. Uh, there were a lot of startups back in the day that were talking about, you know, uh, we're tracking AI with AI kind of elements. We can insert advertising in specific ways because we know the users and we can highlight, for example, the posters, which I think is still there, the posters. If you go to a service like a Netflix, you might see some actors on the posters, but somebody else might see different actors and they'll rotate it okay. for you at some point to kind of think it's fresh, right? And give a different perspective as you make a decision. But I don't know what's the latest, uh, but I certainly, as a user, mm -hmm. don't feel that the services necessarily know me at every particular moment, but I'm sure there's right. a lot of intelligence behind to make sure that I do find something to watch. Okay. Interesting stuff. So, um, I, I I want I'm wondering if um yeah if we get to a point where uh where actually uh they start analyzing content as a, at the uh, scene level kind of they go down and see okay this kind of scene doesn't work let's start uh, producing more of this and more and less of that and so on so what I take from what you said is that uh, most likely that's not being done yet. Uh, not even the signals around uh, kind of if you stop watching an episode at a certain point, this is probably not being used, this data yet. But the interesting thing is that, I mean, if you look at classic TV and uh, what you used to measure the success of an episode or of whatever, just by knowing how many people watched it, that's it. And it was an approximation. Now you know exactly how many people watch them and what time of the day. And you might even have some uh, demographics on the, right, on the kind of people that watch the content and in which location. So you can do a lot more than for sure you were doing in the past. So do you also have, is it also true that there is a lot more content created uh, because of that, because there's more data or I have the feeling that uh, there's so many series being produced these days that all the content platforms are producing series and there's a lot more series, a lot more films being produced. And uh, But the market is not growing 
that much. How does that work? Uh, it's an interesting. Is it, is it stealing from the classic TV and people are moving more to these to these platforms and there's still enough market or there's a lot of failure also out there? I mean, when I was working at Join, what we used to say is the golden age of content creation. Uh, simple, simple, similarly, uh, uh, because basically, uh, video has become such a part of our daily lives. Mm -hmm. um, all of us consume much more video than we consumed two years before that, or mm -hmm. thousand x more than five years before that, perhaps. Um, and I think that it was just an opportunity for a lot of services to come to, you know, to, to market. And the challenge is, is if you're in this business, is that um, you know, as a user, you almost expect to have fresh new things to engage with. So mm -hmm. if you come, let's say, four months in a row in your favorite service and all you see is the same movies. Now, you can do that through new content, but you can also do that through um, you know, smart recommendations from your library. But ultimately, people want to engage with new content to feel that things are fresh on the platform, to mm -hmm. kind of justify in your mind why you're paying monthly subscription service uh, for, right. for, for this. <laughs> Um, and also new content is how you market. So you, you wouldn't see a billboard with a movie from 10 years ago for a service. And especially as a service, if you want to stand out in the crowd, you have to have some flagship content that kind of drives the audience to you. Um, in Join, for example, we had a very successful um, uh, series called Jerks, which was very popular in Germany. And I presume even now it's quite popular. Mm -hmm. And that was an attraction for people to come and check out the service and see what else we have. But you needed that content as a, as a pool. Okay. Now, if you have so many services at the same time are looking for content, you can understand why so many series gets produced and why the, the mm -hmm. need to stay fresh is so high. Okay. Um, the fact that some of these series are still hit or miss shows you that it's not an easy problem to solve, even if you perhaps are implementing data and you're looking at data and uh, there's perhaps not enough signals to 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 understand what really mm -hmm. drives a good series or what drives it outside of people watched it or that they didn't. Uh, but you also have series that are watched, um, but people don't like them because they just will finish them. And that's why sometimes second seasons are more difficult to, to do, or you see other elements of teaching, you know, of, of opportunities to learn about the audience. You know, people now will go on IMDb and check what people are saying about their content, or they'll go on Twitter or... So you have a lot more signals now, but not necessarily within your service. Mm -hmm. um, so the sense is that it's a difficult problem to solve. And I think that, again, if you marry that with the fact that we are, we have different states and different emotions and, and et cetera, um, it's, it's still unsolved in my view uh, problem. So it's, it's, there's a lot of work to do there. For sure. At your, um, at your current company, you also, you also have, um, uh, uh, content, right? There's a thing called, it's called We Present, if I'm not mistaken. So you, right. uh, your company also produces content. Correct. Okay. So uh, is it is it also like, uh, is it also streaming? No, offering? no, it's just, a, it, it's an editorial content that editorial, we produce. Okay. Uh, we, we Present is an editorial platform. Um, okay. And it's incredibly highly curated. We have a, a number of very, very talented individuals who are we're working with artists to collaborate and, and kind of discover talent and highlight talent. Um, so we don't necessarily uh, look at it from a perspective of, oh, what will drive more clicks? Let's get data. Our focus is slightly different. Uh, we want to highlight great talent. And we want to highlight okay. great uh, content and we want to highlight great um, uh, creative moments. So we've taken a bit of a different approach. Again, we're not optimizing for clicks. We're not optimizing for, mm -hmm. for you know, engagement. Not, we're optimizing for- a for... piece that won an Oscar if I'm not yes, this year, yes. right? Yeah, wow. and that was, uh, that was something that I'm super proud of, of the team. Um, it was an idea that came internally that uh, you know, ended up uh, partnering with Riz Ahmed, uh, who is uh, phenomenal. Um, and together we, uh, we basically made uh, a short action live film uh, that mm -hmm. he had, had uh, an idea for for a long time. And we were closely together to make it uh, a, a reality and turned out to be incredibly great piece of content and ended up winning an Oscar. So wow. we transfer this in the, in the small group of technology companies that have won an Oscar, which is uh, not very yes. good as a number. So <laughs> it's incredibly 
proud moment for all of us. Um, That's very interesting. And for us. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, moving to uh, to what you are doing these days. Um, so please correct me if I'm wrong. So we transfer uh, started off as a, well a company that helped people transfer large files. So that was that was how it started. Very heavy on the creative um, people. So people who were like graphic designers and uh, agencies, advertising agencies use that a lot to transfer files. That, that at least that was my first contact with we transfer. But now it's mm -hmm. much more than that, right? Now it's became uh, collaboration tools. Could you talk mm -hmm. a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, as we transfer, we have this ambition to connect the world with creativity. And what we mean by that is to help uh, creative uh, folks um, build sustainable businesses through their talent. What we mean by that mm -hmm. is that we want to help them connect better uh, with the audience and share and collaborate on their content and on their um, cre creative projects with each other and with their kind of audience or clients. So ultimately, we always try to be this agent in between uh, that helps facilitate some of these workflows that creators mm -hmm. have. Um, whether that's you, you know, a photographer working with clients or you know, a content creator who wants to have a more direct engagement and monetization opportunities for her talents mm -hmm. uh, with their, her audience, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started, as you said, the Urban Legend, uh, uh, which we found the talk with the founder, which is back in the day, our founder was uh, part of a creative studio okay. and here in the Netherlands. And uh, the challenge was it was very difficult to teach clients, whether that's on Adidas or, or any other big companies, to use FTP back in the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so the only way to kind of exchange content that you produce for them was to download it on a USB stick and give it to a motorcycle courier and send them on a 30-minute journey and okay. do that several <laughs> times a day. Yeah. And uh, that's how the idea of WeTransfer was born. It was like, well, we, we probably can make that better. And ended up um, the first, I think, uh, WeTransfer product was built on Flash. Uh, on, uh, I think I, I remember know. that. <laughs> you you do, but not many people do. Um, uh, yeah. Flash uh, website building. And ultimately, it was incredible success. So the product has been yeah. viral and a lot of folks. But we, we never lost that connection to the creative community. So we actually grew it. I'm still from the time when uh, I used to work for for an, uh, an astronomy observatory for mm -hmm. the European Southern Observatory in Munich, and I'm still from the time when uh, you'd go to you're a scientist, you need to, you go to the to, to want to to get some data from the scientific archive. We're talking about images with mm -hmm. uh, terabytes, mm -hmm. so you would go online and you would you would make a request for data. And actually, the data would be shipped to you. <laughs> so somebody in the in the archive would go and download the data to a hard disk and then ship it to you uh, using yeah. a shipping company. So you'd get yeah. a hard disk on your mail yeah. because yeah. it was you couldn't transfer terabytes of data over the wire. Uh, mm -hmm. Even even today, it's slow. But you can't mm -hmm. do it now. Um, mm -hmm. It just takes a few days to transfer the files. But at the time, you you would still ship a um, hard disk to <laughs> sometimes very similar problem yes yeah yes. so um so i can relate and uh so and then but then we transfer has evolved from that to what it is today and there are there are a lot of more tools than just file transfer correct correct so today what we've built is it's basically a platform and an ecosystem of, of capabilities that stem from this strong use case of transfer which is Still, how do I share my content with with many many stakeholders, or how do I share it with clients in a, in a way that it's you know very easy for them to understand, very easy to access, and we basically don't stand in between um, you and your audience, whatever that mm -hmm. audience is. And what we've done over the years is that um, we've expanded our capabilities to add on top of um, transfer other you know utility. So, mm -hmm. for example, this year we launched something called portals and reviews which is an opportunity for photographers, for example, or other creatives to bring their clients in this branded environment where they can receive feedback, where they receive um, approvals, where they receive uh, uh, different type of uh, uh, mm -hmm. information back from their clients. 
because if you think about it, even today, you know, if you send somebody something, whether you send it over email or or or, or another for, you know, medium, you have very little control of who sees it, how they consume it. Uh, you have very little um, kind of focus on how you receive that feedback. Mm-hmm. You might receive it over text message or over email, or mm-hmm. it's very difficult to have this back and forth. And what that creates in creative projects is usually a scope expansion, time expansion. It's, it's actually quite difficult to manage, especially if you have multiple clients. Mm-hmm. So for example, this expansion that we launched, which is now part of our um, highest tier of, 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 of our subscription layer, is, is helping those folks to create these environments and bring their clients in the same frictionless mm-hmm. way and then interact with them in a way that actually it's quite easy to digest and quite easy to go back and forth. So this is just an example of how we've thought about, okay, well, what makes us very, very focused is this, again, the core transfer, but how do mm-hmm. we build on top of that to, to help Perfect. other folks? So um, how, does, how, how does data play a role there? Uh, first, to do, deliver a better experience to your customers and then, well, also to to, to help uh, we transfer monetize these um, with this value added that that you provide, the good news is we again we don't optimize for clicks or anything like that. So that's you know we don't use necessarily data for for monetization purposes per se. Okay. Um, but I think that you know as anybody will probably tell you to build a, a great product, you do need to understand have you created somewhere any roadblocks? Have you yeah. is your user experience up to par with what you think it is. And for that, you need to understand how people use it. Because again, you look at it in day in and day out as you build it. And so you need to instrument it. understand the... it, yeah. Uh, however, folks who come in, they have to get it. And you, you understand that through data. So we are very data-driven. Again, um, mm-hmm. we're also quite responsible. We are a certified B Corp. Um, we deeply care about how data is used and deeply care about mm-hmm. um, kind of Privacy and and uh, and and all these mm-hmm. elements of kind of top of mind that for you and for me are as a consumer. Um, so we are very respectful in terms of what data we collect. So ultimately, what we look at is you know does the product work? Where are the roadblocks? Right. Um, what can we optimize? Which flows optimize? And what are we not doing great? Right. So if 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 we see opportunities for us to expand and and we we marry qualitative and quantitative data. For example, as we thought about portals, we did speak to a lot of users and say, hey, you send files to your clients, what is missing? Um, right. Or they say, well, copy feedback, approvals, et cetera. So you learn and then you see the, you know, you build it and you see the um, quantitative data so uh, that shows you that like people user. actually are using that. And so you actually do way. user tests and right. collect it like in more, right. in more classic way. Okay. Correct. And, and then... Compare that data with the instrumentation data from the tools. Correct. Okay. And the good news for us is that we we have an amazing user base, and and as we ask questions, uh, people take the time to to help us understand. Uh, we also have made it you know part of what we do every year, which is go out and speak to creatives across the globe. Uh, we actually uh, each year produce something called the Ideas Report, which we speak to mm-hmm. like 6,500, actually speak to 6,500 creatives from wow. 180 countries. Okay. So we understand trends. We see how they're thinking about their business, how they think about wow. things like sustainability and their workflows. And we try to understand them very deeply. So you collect data in an old school kind of way still? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. It works. It, it's amazing to kind of understand from the people that actually use your, but again, you have to be lucky in many ways. We are very lucky that we have folks who are willing to engage and, and give us their insights and um, help so, us. By, my impression, my impression is that you have quite a um, quite loyal customer base. Uh, these creative people, they, they tend to use these tools and all right. Yeah, we are, yeah. I mean, we are, we are, honestly, we are humbled by that. And then one of the things that keeps me up at night is how do we make sure that we never betray that trust? Uh, yeah. And how do we make sure that we continue to deliver value above and beyond what somebody might expect from a service or, or a company like ours? Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as we do that, I think we'll be okay. But ultimately, for, to do that, you do need to learn uh, from your users. Yeah. You do need to understand how their work is changing. What are some of the trends they're seeing um, and what are your tools helping with and what your tools can help with more mm-hmm. in the future? So how do you how do you see the future um, in terms of, and I'm trying to 
yeah pull the conversation back to the ai topic um and how do you see uh the future of of we transfer uh, of of this industry the creative industry and how ai um, artificial intelligence uh, can help um in the future yeah it's a it's a great question i think all of us are asking us you know ourselves as we read yeah. every day what is kind of the next iteration of, of creativity i think if you if you scroll back 15 years you know back then it, even it, at youtube you know youtube was created as a dating site video dating site nobody had the concept of mm -hmm. creatives uh, or creators uh, for yeah. that matter and now as you can see this is one of the most fastest growing segment of of the global economy and and mm -hmm. just the, the sheer change that we've seen in the last 10 years of video consumption people projecting their talents from youtube to tiktok to snap to whatever um it's quite interesting because you look at that and say well imagine what's going to happen in 10 years and we're already seeing some of these you know trends that are emerging right we mm -hmm. obviously now it's a bit of a what they call crypto winter but ultimately that idea of nfts and decentralization the ability to um directly without a minimum engage with your audience that's quite interesting to kind of see how it evolves but you also yeah. have you know ais that are winning art competitions by you know creating content and, right and and that's uh, ai is writing content uh, compu composing music composing uh, music generating and, and images art yeah. Art. yeah so as you think about this you start to think well what what is really a cre creativity and how can we right. how how is it going to evolve so i spend a lot of time trying to kind of again talk to folks understand uh, keep an eye on these technologies to to see where where the kind of the, the the flow of creativity is going to change in the future but it's very difficult to predict it's a bit threatening um, for the creatives out there thinking that machines could actually do <laughs> A part Indeed. of the work, Indeed. at least a part. Indeed, it, uh, some creators are, are worried. On the other hand, maybe we get to a future where the value of a human creation is much higher than the, you know. We yeah. don't know where. Maybe, where there, maybe there's things that creators do that are boring that they need to do anyway, and they could yeah. be done by a machine instead. Uh, and don't know, like retouching don't a picture, retouching a yeah. picture. Also, oh, some... color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I think it's going to be some type of perhaps intertwined between the human element and, and the machine element but also on the other hand you know uh, creativity is also about interaction so yeah. as a creator the reason why this new way wave of creativity has, has has been born whether it's through social media or, or, or mm -hmm. video or TikTok, is that people want this back and forth um interaction between the creator and, and the audience and maybe that's something machines can never really substitute but i guess that's the that's the joy of being around and, and and looking at these things firsthand. You get to get to have a first um, first row seat to yeah. to the future almost every day. So let's see. But um, I don't think anybody can really predict it. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think we could keep talking for hours. I have so yeah. many questions in my mind. Things like the metaverse and how. Um, how all these pieces come together uh creativity is indeed something that we thought was exclusive of humans and now machines are actually showing that well <laughs> it's, it, it, machines can also be creative right they can create things that are um, um, surprisingly uh, high quality and that as a human sometimes you you will not be able to distinguish to, to tell was this created by a human or by a machine. And uh, so th to me, this means that there's a lot of opportunity out there that that probably that that kind of synergy between humans and machines will become greater and greater in the future and will allow for more um, I think so. things and more creative things to appear. Um, thank you, Alex, for joining us today. Uh, I think I think we could speak for hours about this yeah. stuff, but uh, the time is limited. Uh, thanks for joining us. It was an honor speaking to you. Always a pleasure. Same. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the amazing conversation. And I look forward to future ones on on, on many of those topics. Thank you for watching uh, and listening. Don't forget to like our 
uh, this episode and to subscribe our YouTube channel uh, or to subscribe our uh, podcast in audio and Apple, uh, Google, and Spotify. And see you next time. Yeah.